Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. You could be anywhere, but you are here. So give yourself a pat on the back for that. That is just awesome. So we have a lot of ground to cover, so we're just going to get right into it this morning. And so this morning we're going to be talking about ethics or morals and how do we consider things to be good or bad? How do we make those decisions? And I think whether or not you believe in God, that there is some morals that are important to you, right? And you probably think that they should be important to other people as well, right? And maybe you have been taught that or even believe that morality is like a social construct or it just varies from person to person. I mean, even the Cambridge Dictionary, it defines morality as a set of personal or social standards for good or bad behavior and character. And I believe there is some instances that can be true. I think of language, right? And whenever you're talking about whether it's verbal or nonverbal, you know, somebody does a good job here in the United States, what do you do? You give them a thumbs up, right? But there are some countries you cannot do that, right? That's the same thing as, you know, well, we'll talk about it. If you have a question, I'll tell you what it is. But it's just, you can't do that, you know. And so... But if you try to go somewhere, pick a country, you know, and just land there and just walk up somebody and just kick them as hard as you can in the shin, right? That's going to be offensive. That is probably not, there's probably not some place in the world like, oh, thank you so much, you know? It doesn't work that way, okay? But what if also, you know, somebody just simply just breaks a promise and they continue to break promises to you and they're just like, you know, that's just who I am. I'm a promise breaker. You're just going to have to deal with it. You're probably, after a while, you're going to be like, you know what? That's, that's enough, you know? Someone cheats you out of money. You know, we have all these scammers. Now Now you can hardly even open an email without being scared, you know, or even a chat. We'll get, I'll get chats, and it's like, oh, yeah, come on, you know, it's, it's the Prince of Nigeria or whatever. And it's like, no, no, you know? So and we're, we don't say, you know what, they're just trying to earn a living. It's okay. No, we don't go there, right? So it seems like most of, most of us believe that there is a difference between good and and bad, or the should and the should nots. So how do morals, such as fairness, how do they transcend time and culture? So here lies the tension, right? It's trying to live in a world with God versus living in a world without God. It's trying to navigate our understanding of this life and trying to navigate our understanding about what is good and what is bad and trying to do all this without a higher standard. So this morning, we're going to be talking about this tension of life with God versus without him, and we're talking about morals. Now, I cannot cover everything, obviously. We're just scratching the surface. We're going to hit some highlights here. But let's look at one of the ways we try to have moral standards without God. And the first one is this, social consensus. This is when our morality is shaped and changed by the culture around us. It's that everybody is doing it mentality. So this belief, it it equates goodness with what is considered normal, okay? What's considered normal human behavior. What the majority of people is doing is considered good. Now, social consensus, it throws out prescription, right? The things that you need, you know, what people ought to do. And it focuses instead on description, what people are actually doing. So this viewpoint explains why opinion polls are so popular and talk shows, they dominate our society. You know, people turn to these polls and charismatic so-called experts and they decide what they should believe and what people should do. Right right and wrong is decided by the majority, according to this. Does anybody remember Napster? Anybody here remember Napster, right? You could get music for free, man. It was awesome. But my go-to was LimeWire. I don't know if anybody ever used LimeWire or not. But it was great. And when it first came out, you know, you'd pick your songs. Everybody was file sharing. You didn't think anything. It must be okay, right? Everybody's doing it. You know, there's nothing wrong with this. And then all of a sudden we were reminded, no, that's illegal. 
You know, these artists are not getting paid for what they do. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's right. You know, and then, and then people still continue to do it. Then all of a sudden there was this big thing. They started coming down and finding people with all these, and people were getting sued and all this other stuff. So that's the right. So here's the problem with that, right? Here's the problem with going with the majority, with social consensus. If social consensus is our moral compass, then we are building our morality on a foundation that constantly shifts. And now more than ever, it is shifting all the time. And how do we navigate this, right? How, what if you forgot the memo that day, that this is now wrong and this is now right? You know, can you eat eggs? Can you not, right? I mean, are they good for you? Or are they bad for you? Or butter or margin? You know, it's, it's all the same. It's like, how do we know? You know, but social consensus is just that. It's a consensus. <clears throat> it's a generally accepted opinion or decision among a group of people. And who gave that group of people a right to tell what other people is right or wrong? Unknowingly, it is society at large that does this. Because this is how it works. This ethics, this ethics starts with so-called experts who compile statistics about what humans do or admit doing or claim to do, you know? So they have to have a bit of honesty for this to work. So, for example, their studies may show that the majority of people are sexually active before they are married. So they characterize this behavior as common, right? This is a common behavior for that to happen. And then they go from common and they go to normal. They make it normal. And then it moves from normal to authentic, right? If you are true to yourself or true to human nature, then this is what you should do, right? And then finally they move it to good. It's good for you to do this. So if it is good, then it is what people should do. So what began as description, it morphed into prescription. So in just a few steps... And is, meaning this is what people ought to do, it turned into an ought, that this is what people ought to do. And so now, waiting until marriage is something that, you know, people say, well, just nobody practices it anymore, right? So it becomes abnormal. And then it becomes deviant or weird, you know? And then finally, it becomes wrong, wrong to do it. And so now the people who wait until they are married, they seem as strange, you know, they seem out of touch. And if they keep waiting, they're picked on, right? They're picked on by their peers. But here is something interesting to know about social consensus. It only seems to apply to sacred obligations, things that are considered holy and righteous, which people want less of, and sexual liberties, which people want more of. It doesn't work with personal injury or hurts. I don't know of anyone who would say that if the majority of people were thieves, they would be like, oh, well, theft is a good thing. Yeah, because everybody else is doing it. You know, 51% of the people are stealing. I don't think anybody would say that that was a good thing. The fact that something occurs does not mean that it ought to occur. Ethics means duty, not what is done, but what should be done. Every action requires moral justification, which consensus cannot deliver. Think of it like this. If you have an ethical value of zero, you do not increase its value by assigning it to six billion people, do you? Right? What is six billion times zero? Zero. Exactly. So what does God have to say about social consensus? Well, let's look at Matthew chapter 7. Starting in verse 12. Now, first, Jesus is telling us how to treat each other in a simple yet powerful way. And even though he's talking about salvation next, in the next verse, you can apply it to this majority rules mentality. He's, so starting in verse 12. And I'm reading from the NIV for this verse. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. 
But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. So what is Jesus saying here? The scripture warns us that because of human corruption, people are more likely to be wrong than right. So what is the prescription for us then? Let's look at Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Romans 12, verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Your creator knows what's best for you. He knows what is best for our society. And he knows what's best for what everybody is supposed to do. No matter what everyone else is saying or doing, your creator knows what's best. So let's move on to another way we try to have morals without God. And this lands on more of the individual level. Now everybody, we'll look at this word here. Everybody say it with me. One, two, three. Man, y'all are great. It, I had to like practice that 50 times to say that word. Consequentialism. I probably am still not saying it right. The ends justify the means. Right? The consequence is what matters. Meaning, it confuses morality with utility, right? Whatever works, then it must be right. So this ethic pushes aside motives and means. It concentrates strictly on results. So the thinking here is that if an action produces a positive outcome, then it must be good. So there is a treatise called The Prince. It was written in 1513 that promoted this ethic. And the general theme of The Prince is of accepting that the aims of princes, such as glory and survival, can justify the use of a moral means to achieve those ends. So in other words, in order to maintain his control, a prince should be prepared to use deceitful and ruthless methods. So history is full of such rulers and such governments, right? And our shared moral compass tells us that their methods are evil and not good, we all know intuitively that some acts are noble, some are heinous, right, and entirely apart from whatever they produce. So in contrast, biblical ethics focuses on present duty, not on projected outcomes. Therefore, any act that conforms to God's standard of goodness is right, even in our eyes if it seems to fail. And any action that breaks God's commands is wrong, even if it succeeds. I mean, results are obviously important, correct? You know, the good, good goals justify using every good means to bring them about. But righteous behaviors outweigh results. Even the loftiest goal cannot excuse methods that are evil or wicked. We need to remember that outcomes which are impossible for us to foresee or calculate accurately, and even if we have a good or an ed educated guess, outcomes are God's work. So what are, what are some other things that God has to say about morals? First, God speaks about how and why there are morals that actually do transcend culture and time. Let's look at Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, starting in verse 14. Even Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts, for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them they are doing right. So Paul is saying that God wrote his law on our hearts. In other words, even without God's revelation in the commandments, we intuitively know God's law based on the fact that all of us, whether you believe him or not, were created in his image. But here's the problem. Because of sin, that image is marred and it's disfigured, and that includes our conscience. So even though we know God's commands through our conscience, we tend to distort it, and we will distort it to our own advantage. So when we think about God, we think about morals and rules, where in the Bible do we see this first appear? Where do we first see a higher standard than human thought? 
And this is the very beginning. We're going all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. And one of the things we will see is that some of the big issues that we face today, they're not new, but they have been around since the beginning of time. Ever since, they have plagued humanity, our society, and our cultures. So look at chapter 1, verse 3 of Genesis. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. The light was good. In God's creation of the world, we see statements in Genesis that God saw that it was good. And we can read this in verses 4 and 10 and 12 and 18, 21, 25. And then we go to verse 31 and we said that it, God saw it, looked back at it and he said, it is very good. It is excellent. So right here in the beginning, God is claiming what is considered to be good. It was God who was making the judgment. So what happens when humans stroll on to the picture here, right? So let's look at Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 16. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So here we see that God introduced the first rule to mankind. Based on the fact that they were going to die if they ate from this tree, then obviously it was not good for them. So we move on to chapter 3, and this is the moment of crisis, okay? The serpent came to tempt Eve into eating the fruit and then giving some to Adam. She had the command of God not to eat the fruit. And we know this because she turned around and told the serpent. I mean, look in verse 2. She said, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say... You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. I mean, she heard from God. She understood it. She turned around and said, oh, yeah, God told me this. So she had the word from God telling her that this fruit was not good for her. But in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, we see Eve's response to the serpent's temptation. Verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her. He wasn't off some distance. He was probably just saying, oh, check out what's going on. Now, he was there. So he's also to blame for this, okay? So he ate it. So did, but did you catch what happened here? Up until this point, only God had made judgments about whether something was good or not good. God said that creation was good. He also said very good. In Genesis 2.18, it was God who said that it was not good for man to be alone. In 2.16 and 17, when giving the command about tree, he calls it the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And up until this point, God made the assessment of what was good and what was not good. Mankind did not have any need to know good and evil because this sort of judgment was not his or her place. This tree caused mankind to forget God's assessment of what is good and what is evil and try to make his own assessment of it. It takes mankind from hearing the voice of God and obeying it to looking around and trying to make a determination for himself. Eve made the first assessment of something's value, not only apart from God, but contrary to the word of God. She assessed by looking that the tree was good for food, but eating that tree was the worst thing that she could possibly have done. It led directly to the judgment of God that follows later in the passage, and we know it is a curse that still plagues us today. And there are multiple examples that proves Consuming the fruit from the tree did not actually help mankind be able to decide what is good from bad. One of the most famous examples is that of King David. Most of you probably know this story. The second Samuel 11, 2 Samuel 11:2. He says, One evening David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof he saw, that's important, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. Now, the word here for beautiful is the word tobe, and it is the same word that has been used for good in all these verses that we've been reading in Genesis. And once again, a judgment was based upon sight instead 
of based on, upon, on God's word. I mean, most of you probably know the rest of the story, but you have, if you don't know it, go back. I mean, talk about consequences of sin and then trying to cover up sin and it just spiraling all out of control. If you, if you have, don't know the story, I um, encourage you to go read it. But so even after consuming the fruit of knowledge of good and evil, mankind is no more capable of telling the difference between good and evil than he ever was. We see this here today, right? Mankind is just as desperate as a failure as he was before. And the reason for this is simple. The assessment of goodness is left to God and God alone. For only God is able to accurately make that judgment. When we try to assess things ourselves... We end up just mixing up all the values, right? We end up calling good things evil and evil things good. If we look at Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, he addresses this. He says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We continue to believe this lie that it is right and wrong, that right is wrong is up to us. And it's up to you. And what is good for you may not necessarily be good for me and vice versa. But this is a lie. And this is the same lie that caused Eve to eat from the tree. This is the same lie that got David in all sorts of trouble. It is the same lie that brought judgment on Israel in the days of Isaiah. And it is the same lie that will bring judgment on us if we buy into it. Now, there are some things, like we said before, minor things are left up to the individual or the surrounding culture. But when it comes to what God has proclaimed as something is good or bad, there is no gray. God's word lays out the way we should live. Praise God for that. It lays out the types of things that we should and should not do. One of the reasons for God giving us his word, is that God knows that our judgment is faulty. He knows that if the judging is left up to us, more than likely we will make the wrong choice. And he knows that we will end up calling good evil and evil good. So God has laid out the answers for us. He has told us what is good and what is evil so we don't have to rely on our own faulty judgment. And here is something that will probably make some of us very uncomfortable. When I was younger, it made me very uncomfortable. We don't have to understand the reason behind God's command to obey them. Ouch. Right? We don't have to know why something is good or bad in order to obey it. In fact, the whole reason that God has told us he knows we are unable, unable to properly differentiate between good and evil. And that's okay to ask God questions, right? It's okay to try to understand things. But we cross the line when we refuse to adhere to God's word until we completely understand it. Think of a two-year-old, if you've ever had any kids, and they want to touch that hot stove, right? And you might even tell them, hey, it's hot. And they're like, hot? What does that mean, fun? They don't know, right? And they, they start reaching up. But you know, right? You know. And they just can't fully comprehend. So you tell them, no, you can't do that. I think of prayer. I'll be the first to admit, prayer is a mystery to me. I don't, I mean... God's word tells me that it works. God's word tells me that I'm supposed to do it. But there's certain aspects of prayer that are a mystery about how, how God, you know, how he interweaves his will into our decisions and all those kinds of things. It's a mystery. But God tells me that I should pray, so I do pray. And then I see how, you know, there's how God makes things happen. And it's like, wow, how did you do that? You know, some things are just based on faith. We're not going to understand everything. Our, you know, our humans, as human beings, we think we know so much more than we do. But when you're talking about us compared to an all-knowing God, how much do we really know? Do you think Eve knew why she wasn't allowed 
to eat from the forbidden tree, like knew everything, right? She was told one thing. God said not to eat her or she would die. But she didn't realize, she, didn't, she couldn't foresee all the consequences that happened because she did that. It should have been enough for her that God said not to do it, that she should run away as fast as she could to get away from that. But it was her distrust of God and his word that led her to eat from the forbidden tree. And this brings us back to the Garden of Eden and back to what is the biggest element of obeying God's standards of good and evil is, whether we understand them or not. The element is faith and trust. Romans 10, 17 says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Faith comes from one thing. And that is hearing the word of God. Eve heard the word of God. She had the word from God that said, do not eat from this tree. She heard his voice, but then she heard another voice. And that was the voice of the serpent. And in the beginning of chapter 3, the serpent begins to make Eve doubt the word of God. He begins to make her doubt even the very character of God. Instead of God making this judgment a good and evil for her, now she perceives as God manipulating her for his own benefit. And instead of listening to the voice of God who had lovingly created her, she listened to another voice. She allowed herself to doubt God's word. You see, for her, it was no longer a decision of, did God say it or not? She knew that. It wasn't even a choice of whether she would obey God or not, or at least in her mind, it wasn't even a question of whether God knew what was best for her. She went even deeper to question whether God wanted what. And Adam was not innocent either, right? In God's judgment of Adam, we see that he is guilty of the same thing. When we see in Genesis 3.17 to Adam, he said, because you listened, because you listened to your wife, and ate from the tree about which I commanded you. Adam listened to the voice of his wife instead of listening and obeying the voice of God. So we have voices all around us all the time, right? We have people that speak all sorts of ideas in our ears that are contrary to the word of God. That your kids should be the center of your world so it's okay to ignore your spouse. But you got to remember you got about 18 years or so, and then that spouse is who you're with for the next however long, right? And then, so then you're looking at a stranger. It's okay to love your kids, absolutely. But you can't make them the center of your world, and then all of a sudden, oh, who, who are you, right? Or that shady business is okay. Changing a little number on your taxes, it's fine. Everybody else is doing it. You know, watching that little bit of pornography, everybody does it. It's okay. But our very society is so turned against God that we are bombarded with messages that are contrary to God's word. The trouble is that many times these messages, they make sense to us, right? Sometimes they, they sound like friendly voices. That's the scary part, you know, and it, they're, that they're so close to the truth that we almost, that we believe that it's truth. But these voices only have one aim. The voice is contrary to God's word, has one aim. Their only goal is like the serpent, to discredit the voice and the word of God. Trusting in God is listening to and obeying the word of God, even when all around us we hear voices telling us, it isn't true. I'd like our musicians to come up. So we, like Eve, we have one choice. We have a choice. Will we believe in, and trust in God and his word? Or will we trust in what our senses tell us? See, the purpose of the voice is to get us to look, right? The voices that contradict God's voice is to get us to look at our circumstances, what's going on around us. And they may get us to look at our circumstances and evaluate God's word in light of them. 
So we may look at something that the Bible says and think that it's a good suggestion or may even be possible, maybe in an ideal world, right? But it just doesn't work in the real world. We may have those kinds of thoughts. But we need to remember that the Bible has a very strong ethical message. God is very concerned about how we treat other people. Those other people who might believe differently politically than you do. He's very concerned. God is very concerned when we take advantage of someone and gaining at their expense. And so the simple message is this. The word of God does work. And it works for the ultimate good. For what God has deemed good. To live in a world closer to what God originally intended to be before sin came into the world. But in order for this to work, you have to practice obedience. If we don't obey God, then it won't work. If we start to second-guess God and decide which parts we will obey and which parts are just not for us, then it's not going to work. If we start to listen to the voices around us that tell us which parts we can be expected to do or not to do, if we start looking at our circumstances of life and determining which parts of God's word will fit and which will not fit, then it's not going to work. The life lived in light of the scripture is a life that works. But the life lived in light of God's word is first and foremost, it is a life of faith. So before you can approach any of the individual mandates of scripture in a meaningful way, you must first take a step of faith and trust God with your salvation with your life now and for the rest of eternity and you must place your life in his hands knowing that he knows better than you and better as far as what is considered good and evil and when you ignore the voices and the sights around you you won't mix up good and evil for God has already laid out this for you and the Holy Spirit will help guide you and the life of trust, it doesn't allow for selective obedience, okay? It's, it's all or nothing. So let's give ourselves to following all of God's word. And then we will see that we will inherit all of God's promises. Let's pray. Well, Father God, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you just help us have faith, God, to trust you. In all the areas of our life, even when it's difficult, Lord, we ask for courage, God. We ask for courage to do what is good in your eyes, Lord. As it is written in your word. And we pray that everything we do, no matter what the worldly voices tell us, no matter our circumstances, that whatever we do is pleasing to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, I'd like everybody to stand. At this time, we are going to worship with one last song. And as we worship, the altar will be open for anyone who would like to come and have a few moments alone with God. Or you can just stay at your seat and pray. Just be obedient to whatever the Holy Spirit is prompting you to do this morning. So the altar is open and let's worship together.